This is a great day we get to celebrate one of the two institutions that the Lord has given the church, the other being baptism. But here today, we get to gather in the Lord's house on the Lord's day and celebrate the Lord's table. Would you take your Bibles with me, please? And if you don't have one, please use the few Bibles there and turn to Luke chapter 22. Would you do that with me, please? Luke chapter 22. We'll be reading verses 14 through 20, talking about one meal ending and another one beginning. Would you stand with me as I read aloud from the Word of God, Luke 22, starting down in verse 14. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Would you bow and pray with me, please? Father, we are overwhelmed. As we stand here today, surrounded by our family, our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are grateful that so many are here today, and we are grateful that we get to share this Lord's Supper with them. Would you please help us to see and to understand in these next few moments why this supper means so much, that this would never be an empty tradition or an empty ritual but always one that is filled with great meaning, great relevance, and even great sorrow as we think about what you suffered for us. But yet great joy in knowing that you did that for us because you loved us so. You gave us the very best of yourself, so how can we not give you the very best of ourselves? Would you guide us now to remove all distractions, Put all the other things of this world away, all the things on our cell phones and all that kind of stuff to put it away so that we focus on what you're saying to us here, that this supper is one that is special and it matters so, so much. And we pray this in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. It is our great privilege here today that we are coming here to the Lord's table as a church family at the close of this service, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And I thought it would be good for us here today to look at what Dr. Luke writes about here in the 22nd chapter of when he wrote about the Lord Jesus Christ instituting or beginning this supper. When I say it is our great privilege to you today as brothers and sisters in Christ, to partake of these elements of the Lord's Supper. I want you to know that I am not overstating this. I am not hyping this. I am not exaggerating things at all. So often I think our greatest problem today inside the church is that where we become so familiar with glorious things that they're no longer glorious to us. They're just things that we're used to. For far too many of us, our Christianity has become like a coin that's been in circulation for so long All the edges are rubbed off, and even some of the print is rubbed off because it's been in circulation for so long. A coin like that loses its distinctive features. You can't read much on it. You can't see much on it. And it kind of becomes slick. And sadly, I think much of our Christianity today has become slick with the usage. And we need to beg the Lord God by His grace and mercy, by the power of His Spirit, to bring the wonder and the glory of our Christianity back to our hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to return to the glory of this, do we not? To see how glorious this is. 
I trust that God will, will be pleased to do this today for us, even today, as we look here in Luke chapter 22, and then as we come to the Lord's table after the worship service ends. Now, when we look here at these verses, verses 14 through 20, that we can only really understand this passage if we see that Jesus is ending one meal and he's beginning another one. That's why the title's in your bulletin, One Meal Ended and Another Begun. What does this mean, one meal ended and another begun? I'm suggesting to you that the Lord Jesus came here together with his disciples just hours before he goes to the cross of Calvary to observe the Passover, the Jewish practice of the Passover. You can go back to verse 7 of the same chapter. It says, then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. So this is the setting of why they're together, the Passover. But this was the last Passover that these men would observe, the very last one. I'll need to explain that more in just a minute, in just a few moments. The Lord Jesus observed the Passover with these men, but then before the evening was over, he changed over to another meal completely. He changed over from that. He began another meal, and that is the meal that we now call the Lord's Supper, this one that we're about to celebrate here in a little bit. It is the meal that we observe today. And I suggest to you that this is the right way, the proper way to understand these verses 14 through 20. I think you'll find that this clears up a lot of the confusion because in verses 14 through 18, Jesus is observing the Passover. These verses deal with the Passover. And then in verses 19 and 20, he begins and he institutes the Lord's Supper. Now, some people have read these verses and they found themselves puzzled and confused by the mention of one cup down there in verse 17. Do you see it? It says, then he took the cup and he gave thanks. And then another cup is down there in verse 20 where it says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper. They're confused by this and they wonder, well, now, wait a minute, we only have one cup at the Lord's Supper. We only pass around one cup. We pass little cups to everybody. What do you mean two different cups? What is this? People have said over the years, I don't get it. I'm confused. How is there more than one? We have two cups here. Why is that? Here's why. In verses 14 through 18, it's talking about the Passover, the Passover cup, where he's observing the Passover. But then in verses 19 and 20, this is the cup of the Lord's Supper. Verses 14 through 18, the cup of the Passover. Verses 19 and 20, the cup of the Lord's Supper, the new meal that Jesus has started here. The cup that they drank from at that time is in connection with the Lord's Supper, this new meal that he started here on this night when they are remembering the Passover. So again, I say that's the right way to understand these verses, to approach this passage. One meal ended and another begun. So as you might suspect, I want to talk to you today about these two meals, the first one that ends and the second one that begins. The first one that ends is the Passover meal. The second one that begins is what we call the Lord's Supper. Now, this may sound terribly technical and dreary, but I'll make an agreement with you if you'll come alongside me here. I'll try not to be too technical, not too dreary, and I'll try to get to the glory of this, okay? I'll try to get right to it. But you listen for the glory of it, all right? And so that when it comes to the glorious part of this, you won't miss it. You'll understand. Here's the glorious part. So do we have an agreement here, okay? I'll not be too technical, but listen for the glory of this so you don't miss it. Well, let's look at this first meal of the Passover. And by the way, there was glory in this Passover meal also. The Passover meal takes us all the way back to the Old Testament, the days of Exodus and Moses and Israel, when they're in bondage to Egypt, in slavery to Egypt. You remember how God sent Moses to Pharaoh, sent his brother Aaron along with him to tell the Pharaoh, let God's people go, let the people of Israel go free from their bondage there in Egypt. And you remember how various plagues came on Egypt because the Pharaoh said, no, you're not going to go. You're our labor force, our slave force. We're not going to turn you loose. All kinds of plagues. There are actually 10 of them. You remember them? Frogs, lice, locusts, darkness, hail. And if you're wondering, why did God choose those things? Well, in the Egyptian culture, they actually worship frogs, among other things. So God is turning their idols into plagues. And Pharaoh refuses after each plague to let the people of Israel go. He says, no, you're not going to go. You work for me. I'm ruling the place. But then God said there's going to be one more plague. After he sends nine, he sends one more. Remember that one? He said, I'm going to send my death angel 
over the whole land of Egypt. The death angel is going to kill the firstborn of every family, of all in the land of Egypt. But I'm going to make a special provision for the people of Israel. So he tells them to do what? To take lambs without a blemish, without a spot, to kill those lambs, and to take the blood of those lambs and smear it on the doorposts and on the doors of their homes. You remember the story? And here was the promise that God made. He said, when the death angel passes over the land of Egypt on this night when I send him, and when he sees the blood on the doors, on the doorposts of your homes, He will not bring my judgment upon you, upon the firstborn of your houses, but he will literally pass over. That's where the name Passover comes from. You get the term Passover. He will pass over those houses. Judgment will not come, but these Israelites who are in these houses, marked by the blood of those lambs, will be spared the judgment. That's exactly what happened. Israelites took the lambs, they killed them, slit their throat, shed the blood, took the blood, put it on the doors and the doorposts of their homes. And when God's death angel came that night over the land of Egypt and saw the blood, he passed over those homes and they were delivered. And by the way, Pharaoh was convinced then that they had better let the people of Israel go. And he did. Even his own firstborn died that night. God appointed the Passover meal to commemorate and to honor and to memorialize the deliverance of the people of Israel. It was set aside to remember this on purpose when God set them free from the land of Egypt. You remember this story from when you were a child. If you've been in Bible school or Sunday school as a child, you know this. The same time you learned about Noah and the flood and and Jonah, uh, Jonah and the big fish and Joshua in the city of Jericho and David and Goliath, this is a common well-known Bible story of the Passover and God bringing his people out of Egypt. But I want to suggest to you this morning that when those Israelites killed those lambs and put the blood of those lambs on the doorposts and doors of their homes, there was more going on there than just deliverance from Egypt. As bad as it was to be in slavery, there's more going on. There was a major blessing from God coming to them without question. To be free from Egypt was a major blessing. But there's more going on than just that. These people were looking forward in faith to the coming Messiah, the one God had promised them. These people knew that they had a greater bondage than the bondage in Egypt. Folks, even if you're a slave, you know there's something worse than being a slave to someone else. It's being a slave to sin, is it not? That's much worse. Much worse. They knew that the greater bondage that they had was bondage in sin, and they knew that only one person could take care of their sin problem, take care of their bondage to sin, and deliver them from that bondage, and that was the one who was to come someday, the one who had been promised by God. Whenever they killed those lambs and spread that blood on their doors and doorposts, they were realizing the guilt of their sin. They knew that they were sinners. They knew that. And they were looking forward in faith to the coming Messiah who would be the perfect Lamb of God. Those lambs that were killed back in Passover days, that night here in Luke 22, when they celebrated the Passover, would not be able to put away their their sins. But those lambs could picture and did picture the coming one who could who would be able to put away their sin. There's a reference in John's Gospel, John chapter 1, verse 29. You remember what John the Baptist says? He sees Jesus come on the scene. He's about to be baptized by John the Baptist. And what does he say? He says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Aren't you glad Jesus is that Lamb? He didn't say, Behold, the great philosopher. He didn't say that. He didn't say, behold the great teacher or the great moral example. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was essentially saying to that Jewish audience, do you remember back there hundreds of years ago, reading about it and hearing about it, when our forefathers took the blood of lambs that they had killed and they put it on their doors and their doorposts, and God spared them on that night. Do you remember that story? John is saying, do you remember that? They were looking forward in faith that night to the coming Messiah. 
Well, here he is, ladies and gentlemen. Here he is, the Messiah. He has arrived. This is the one that the Bible is talking about. He's right here in our midst. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was the meal that ended. And that meal was the Passover. If the Passover meal was designed to look forward in faith to the coming of the Lord Jesus and the dying of the Lord Jesus on the cross, you understand that now that Jesus was just a few hours away from offering himself on Calvary's cross, that there was no more purpose for the Passover meal, no more reason for it. Jesus fulfilled it. The thing that the Passover had anticipated was here fulfilled. No more purpose, no more reason to observe the Passover because the one that the Passover anticipated, Jesus, is now there in their midst. No more reason to do this. He's on the scene. On top of that, you know that the very next day, after observing this Passover meal with his disciples, on the very next morning, Jesus Christ goes to Calvary's cross, and there as the Lamb of God, he sheds his blood, fulfilling the Passover of the Old Testament. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And that means there's no more reason for the Passover. And that's the reason you have the Apostle Paul saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that Christ is our Passover. Christ is our Passover. Not something else. So this meal that was brought to an end on this occasion, Jesus observed this Passover with his disciples. But now there's no more reason to observe it after this. Because the one that the... Passover anticipated, came and offered himself as the Lamb of God on the very next day on Calvary's cross. But after observing the Passover, the Lord Jesus with his disciples, after anticipating with them his coming death on the cross, now he begins a new institution. Go with me now to verses 19 and 20 again. He now begins what we call, what we're celebrating today is the Lord's Supper. We see it here in verse 19. And he took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, folks, you understand the Lord's Supper is very different from the Passover. Very different. These are not the same things. Why did Jesus start and begin and institute this Lord's Supper? Well, the Passover looked forward in faith to the Christ who was to come, but the Lord's Supper now looks backward in faith to the Christ who has come. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what we observe today is a memorial feast. It is intended. You see the words on the on the Lord's Supper table, do this in remembrance of me. On purpose, intentional, remember what Jesus did, what Jesus gave. It looks backward to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on Calvary's cross. So how do we go about this business of looking backward? Well, these verses 19 to 20 show us. We're told here Jesus in verse 19 takes the bread, he gives thanks, he breaks it. And then in verse 20, he does something else. He also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. This is how we look backwards on purpose. Looking backwards to what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross. We partake of the bread and the cup. Now, I want to just remind you of the importance of the bread and the importance of the cup. These things matter. The bread, of course, represents the body of Jesus, the Lord Jesus. But I think we can go further than that, and I think we should go further than that. The bread not only represents the body of the Lord Jesus, but it represents the sinless humanity of the Lord Jesus, the sinless humanity of the Lord Jesus. Now, you may be saying, well, now, is that a big deal, the sinless humanity of the Lord Jesus? Well, like my late mom used to say, you better know it. It matters. It's important. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is important for us to know that Jesus never, ever sinned, ever. 
Here's one thing that most people do not realize about getting into heaven. So now hang on to something. Hold your loved one, brace yourself, here it comes. The Bible teaches us that in order to get into heaven, you have to be as good as God is. Anybody here want to say that? You're as good as God is. You've got to be 100% perfectly righteous. Now, does that make you feel kind of down and discouraged and depressed? You mean to tell me that I have got to be as good as God is, and I've got to be perfect in order to get into heaven? Uh Uh-huh. That's what we're saying. You mean that's the standard of anybody getting into heaven? I most certainly do. Yes, that's what I mean. That's the standard. And I hope you do feel some discouragement and some despair at this point because only as you feel some sense of discouragement and despair will you feel the glory of the Christian message. I told you we'd get to the glory. Here's the glory of it. You don't have the righteousness that God demands of you to get into heaven now, do you? Is anybody going to sit here and say, well, I've never made a mistake. I've never sinned. You just did. You lied. You might as well agree with me because I know the truth about you. I know the truth about all of you. You don't have the righteousness that God demands. You might be saying, well, how do you know that about me? We don't know each other that well. Well, I know about you because I know about me. You're one of me. You're you're like me. And I know that I don't have the righteousness that God demands. On my best day, I don't have it. Here is the terrible, terrible dilemma that we're in. We have a holy God out there in eternity, demanding perfect righteousness, and we don't have the righteousness that God demands. That sounds like a problem to me. Doesn't it sound like one to you? You know what the Bible says about our righteousness, does do you not? Back there in the Old Testament in Isaiah 64, verse 6, he says, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. On our very best day, they're like filthy rags. That's the Old Testament. Here's what the New Testament says in Romans 3.10. There is none righteous, no, not one. That's talking about all of us. You mean people in high places are not without sin? You mean preachers are sinners? If you doubt me, Brendan Ryan will be available after the service. <laughs> To explain. Yeah, he's a sinner. So are they. So are we all. But here's the good news, my friends. The very God who demands perfect righteousness from us to let us into heaven is the same God who has provided the very righteousness he demands. Aren't you glad about that? The God who says, I demand perfection, has provided perfection. How did God provide the righteousness that He demands? He provided it in the sinless life of His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, like most people, I read the opinion polls. I read the surveys. I see what the American people are thinking. Every year, a man named George Barna does a pretty intensive survey of the religious beliefs of Americans, and he publishes it year by year. Now, if you're not sick, when you start reading it, you will be sick by the time you finish reading it. Survey after survey shows that most Americans do not believe that Jesus Christ was without sin. If you want a name, her name is Oprah. Of course he sinned. He's human. They believe that Jesus committed sins. I told you about this last year in boys camp. Ten-year-old. Well, of course he sinned. Jesus lost his temper. And that's a sin, don't you know? I'm thinking, listen, you little brat, you've lost your temper. But, you know, that's another story. But... Anyway, what a shocking and breathtaking thing that Jesus is a sinner. May I simply say to you this morning that you better hope that Jesus didn't commit any sins. I'll tell you why. Because if he did commit even one sin, you and I have no salvation, nothing. We are without hope and without help. If he even committed one, just one, and nobody can say, I've just committed one. Your salvation depends on Jesus living that perfect life that you and I cannot live, giving God the righteousness that He demands so that God will impute or count that righteousness as it is as yours when you receive it by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we sing about it. We've got a song in our hymn book called The Solid Rock. Here's one of the lines of the song. Dressed in His righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. 
That's how. And when we partake today of this bread, we are thanking God for the sinless humanity of Jesus that He lived out for us, that He practiced in that body that He received. Now, we are rejoicing in the sinless humanity of Jesus today. And we are understanding as we rejoice in His sinless humanity that if it were not for the righteousness of Jesus Christ, there would be absolutely no hope for us, none, zero, no hope at all. Thank God for the sinless humanity of Jesus. Amen? Thank God for that. But we come today not only to partake of this bread, which represents His sinless humanity, but we also come to partake of this cup. You'll receive it here in just a little bit. And there's no doubt what this cup represents, is there? You know what it represents. Jesus says it there in verse 20. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. The cup represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And as we partake of this cup today, we are called to rejoice in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I realize that bothers some people these days. They say, oh, I don't like all this old bloody religion that some of you preachers preach. You always talk about the blood of Jesus. I don't like all this blood business. I'd like my religion to have no blood in it at all. Over 30 years ago, a man preached his trial sermon in a a Baptist church in southern Illinois. One of the men of that church came up to him after the service was over and he said, you're not one of those blood preachers, are you? Now, the preacher had preached on Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. If you know the text, it says, without shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no forgiveness. There was nowhere for that preacher to hide. I'm glad to say that same preacher has preached the blood of Jesus for years and years now. And he continues to preach today the blood of Jesus. Oh, that we would have more men who are not afraid to preach about the blood of Jesus. That's what saves us. The preacher pled guilty when that man said that to him. And he said, yes, I am one of those blood preachers. I am. And by the way, that man who asked that question became a very dear friend of that pastor, very loyal supporter of that preacher. That preacher convinced that man over time that we should all embrace the blood of Jesus and we should love the blood of Jesus. Should we not? We should love the blood of Jesus. But let me ask you today. Do you understand the importance of the blood of Jesus? Do you get it? Do you understand it? We do not come into this world in a state of peace with God. We do not come into this world in a state of friendship with God. We don't. The Bible says just the opposite is true. The Bible says we come into this world in a state of alienation or separation from God. We are not naturally His children. Folks, we are natural born sinners, are we not? We are, aren't we? We are. The Bible has very strong terms about this. The Bible says that we are by nature the enemies of God. So what is this issue between us and God? that alienates us from Him, that separates us from Him, so that we don't have peace with Him. What is this issue? The issue is sin. If you want to know what's wrong with the world, the answer is real simple. S-I-N. That's the problem. This is not God's fault. This is the result of sin. Understand that we cannot be rightly related to God and have fellowship with God. We cannot stand accurately or acceptably in the presence of God when we come to the end of this life and we go out into eternity if the issue of sin is not dealt with in our life. And there's only one way. Hear me. Listen to me now. There's only one way for that sin problem to be resolved. Just one way. There's only one way for that sin to be taken out of the way so that we are no longer alienated and separated from God, but we are now at peace with God. There's only one way for that to happen. What is that one way? The penalty for the sin has to be paid. That's how. Someone's got to pay. You see, God's a holy God. And He has pronounced the penalty upon our sins. And I say to you that sin cannot be removed between ourselves and God until that penalty is paid. And what is the penalty that God requires? that God has pronounced upon our sins? Hear me now. It's a terrible, horrifying penalty. The penalty that God has pronounced on our sins 
is nothing less than His wrath and nothing less than eternal separation from God. You want to know why hell's so bad? Listen to me now. Here's why hell's so bad. You are forever separated from God as your Father. You will never know Him as your Father. But thank God for Jesus and thank God for the shed blood of Jesus. Amen? Thank God for that. I'm telling you, my friends, that Jesus came for the exact purpose of paying the penalty for our sins so that all who believe in Him will never have to pay that penalty themselves. Aren't you glad you don't have to pay your own sin penalty? Folks, I'll admit I could not pay it. Could you? When I tell you that Jesus Christ went there to Calvary's cross and poured out His blood, He was paying the penalty for sinners. What does blood mean anyway? It means life poured out in death. You've heard the term bloodshed, haven't you? That means something or someone dies. When I tell you that Jesus poured out His life and death there on the cross, I'm telling you that He was receiving that penalty for our sins. Jesus never committed any sins. I don't care what surveys say. He is perfect without sin. The only person who's ever lived down here who can say that. Now here's the glory of it all. If you will take refuge in Jesus, if you will say, Oh God, I know the truth about myself. I know that I'm a sinner. I know this. The truth is, I am under your just condemnation. The truth is, I'm a sinner, but I can take refuge in Jesus. I can find in Him my hiding place. I hide in Him. I take His shed blood as my only hope, my only help. What is that shed blood? It's life being poured out in death. It's Jesus receiving the penalty of death that you and I deserve. He didn't deserve this. We do. If you will take refuge in Jesus today, God will not twice punish for the same offense. He will not punish Jesus for your sins, for your offenses, and then punish you too as well. So I'm begging you, if you are sitting here lost, if you've never trusted Him, take refuge in Jesus. You must not think that when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, that He died just a physical death. I know it's what people think. I think a lot of people get confused at this, puzzled at this point. They see Jesus dying there on the cross and they understand Him to have died there on that cross and they they think only in terms of the physical death, the bloodshed, the thorns, the nails, the spear, the beating, the whipping. They know that back in those times, the Romans crucified a lot of people. It wasn't just Jesus. Before He came along, they crucified a lot. After He died, they crucified a lot. Crucifixion was a common thing to the Romans. Here are preachers standing in pulpits today, at least I hope they are, and saying to their audiences, look to that man Jesus on that cross. Some of the people sitting there are saying, why look to Jesus? Why? Why look at Him? Lots of people are being crucified in those days. What's special about Him? What makes the crucifixion of Jesus so special anyway? Here's the answer. Jesus died more than just a physical death. Much more. Something was going on there when Jesus died between Him and God the Father. Something that had been planned and mapped out even before the world began, the Bible tells us. Because the Bible says He is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Here's what it was. When Jesus died there on the cross of Calvary, it was more than just a physical death. As painful as it was, as painful as it looked, as horrible as it seemed, it's more than that. He actually suffered the agony of eternal death. Eternal death. While He's there on the cross. What is eternal death? It's being separated from God forever. And Jesus cried out there on the cross. You remember this? We're going to have a sermon about this during Holy Week. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You remember that? Jesus cried that out. He said it because He was God forsaken. In those hours, He hung there. What is death? Separated from God. Forsaken of God. 
Some will say he could not have suffered an eternity's worth of wrath. He couldn't have been eternally separated from God because he was only on that cross from 9 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It can't be an eternity's worth. But if they understood anything about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, they wouldn't be saying only now would they. This was not like any other crucifixion. But because Jesus was God in human flesh, He was an infinite person. And as an infinite person, He could suffer in a finite or a limited amount of time an infinite or unlimited amount of wrath, taking the punishment of all the sins of all the people across all of time who would ever trust and believe in Him. That's what makes the crucifixion of Jesus special because Jesus Christ essentially went to hell on Calvary's cross because He died for the sins of others. He went to the cross and He poured out His blood in death so that all who believe in Him will not have to experience eternal death themselves. But I can join the Apostle Paul in saying these words from Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad if you're sitting here saved, there's no more condemnation for you? Aren't you glad? It's far more fascinating than what's on your phone right now, okay? There's no condemnation for you because Jesus took it for you. I don't know about you, but when we come to this table here in just a few minutes, And these elements, the bread, the cup, are passed around and we partake of this bread. I want my heart to go out in praise and glory to God, saying, thank you, Father, for the sinless humanity of Jesus. And when we drink this cup here in just a few moments, I want my heart to go out to God in worship and in praise and say, thank you, Father, for the shed blood of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's bow together and let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we bow before you today and we realize again, I hope everyone clearly understands and realizes again what you did for us, Jesus, when you went to Calvary's cross and how this bread and this cup are symbols and memorials to what you did. How your body was beaten, bruised, battered, spat upon, your beard ripped out, your back torn open, your head under the crown of thorns, the nails in your hands and feet, the spear in your side. This is what the bread represents, the body of Jesus. And the blood is represented in the cup and how you shed such blood for us. Dear God, you know all hearts here today. There's no one who can hide. There's no one who can pretend. No matter how much they're not paying attention at this moment, that doesn't matter. They're going to answer to you someday, God. And it matters now that they listen. Listen carefully and listen closely. That Jesus died my soul to save and that we would never get over the glory of that that we would find that far more fascinating than anything else in this world in this life and now Father just a few moments as we celebrate these things may we seriously and strongly remember what Jesus did if there is someone here today who has never trusted you We're asking now, God, that they would trust you. Even now, they would trust you. Lord, we're praying that everyone in this room is saved and born again. That they don't have to wonder or worry when they lay their head down at night if they were never to wake up again where they would be. Because they've trusted you and you have saved them. They put all their hope, all their confidence, all their faith in you. Not something else, not someone else, but you. Dear God, may that be the case here today. But if there's someone here who's not, in this very serious moment, dear God, would you speak to that heart, that man, that woman, that boy, that girl, 
Draw them to yourself and show them they are lost, hopeless, and helpless without you. But with you, there's life, there's joy, there's peace. Dear God, would you hear our prayer this morning as we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.